guys. Yeah, sorry. We were running a bit behind. I was chatting too much. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Picked us off. Yes. But as you see, I have our beloved Seth doll. And I'm so excited that he's with us. And I'll wait for some of you guys to jump on. Hey, go ahead and share this now on your page. Every parent, well, actually, everybody, everybody can I, can needs to share it on mine right now, too. Yeah, share it on yours. I'm going to make sure I share it on mine, too. Let me make sure this is up and running and shared. Yeah. As we're sharing, you know, Seth carries um, an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit. So everybody needs to hear from Holy Ghost, you know, and it says unless you're like a child, you can't enter into the kingdom. So just by the conversation alone, you know, it'll help your natural brain even enter into the kingdom. Yeah. So share it with everybody that that needs God. I'm on. Let me make sure I have it on here. Yeah, okay. Oh, everyone's jumping on. Hi, Becky. Hi, ja Josh Atkins. <laughs> hello, Marion. Hello, Tina. Hello. Yeah, I really get Seth um, because I'm very much like a child. I, I learn like a child. I was showing Seth I have a, um, a kid's Bible, you know, and that's how I learn. And um, I just... I just love the freedom and being like a child because it it uh, presents itself as humility. And I'm chatting a lot. So, beloved sir, would you introduce yourself? Tell us who you are and where you're from. Well, I live in Austin, Texas right now, just outside Austin, Texas. My name is Seth Dahl. Um, we have my wife and I have three children, two dogs, one, one blind cat, two horses, a pregnant cow and thousands and thousands of bees. Um, so we live in a land flowing, will be flowing with milk and definitely is already flowing with honey. And um, I I do, I have a ministry or called Football Ministries, but we also have like a Facebook group that is around the book that we're talking about called Parenting. And so, yeah, I've worked with children for a really long time. 17 years now at this point and we yeah i've i've like written a lot of curriculum specifically but the last few years have been more than that and i finally realized if what happens in the church doesn't happen in the home it's not actually christianity and we run the risk of raising children in event-based religion where christianity is something we do something we do on sundays wednesdays not who we are and Christianity is not what we do it's who we are and then from who we are we do certain things and we live that way as a lifestyle not as a service oriented uh, event based yeah so, I've been working with kids and parents for a while um, yeah. outside of Austin I know. lived in California with children's past at Bethel Ch Bethel Redding for 10 years and then worked in new york for four years before that doing sidewalk sunday school so lots of time with children sidewalk sunday school mm -hmm. what is yeah. that so we had trucks we had 17 trucks i think they have more now i'm not 100 sure how many they have but the side of the truck flips down into a stage and as a uh, toy trail puppet stage uh speaker system and you stand on the stage and then it's inside the truck is actually a backstage area where you can put on costumes and everything. But so we had 17 trucks that would go around to Bronx, Harlem, Queens, Manhattan, Coney Island, all these places. And so 17 services would simultaneously take place after school. On five days a week. We reached 20,000 kids every week. At Christmas, we reached 60,000 kids a week. They'd come. We were the only ones. We gave out every kid a present. We had 60, 70,000 presents that we had that we could give out. We send in presents, send in money, and then we buy presents from all over. And then, um, yeah, so we, we do 17 services in one spot. Every truck would pack up and go to another location, in the, always in the project. So, um, like some of the worst, roughest places in New York. We would pack up one and then go to the next one until it got too dark. So most days we would preach two or three times a day. Wow. Hey, yeah. Seth. Yeah, as you move closer, I can actually hear you. Is it? I, I don't know if people are reporting sound uh, issues. 
How's that? Is that better? That's better for me. Is that okay. better for you guys? I don't have my head. Wait, I have headphones. You want me to get headphones and put it in? Yeah. Is that cool? Yep. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Wait till you see the questions we're going to ask him. Okay, good. That's better. Yeah. Hey, and, and of course they decided to mow the lawn oh. where I am right now. So. What? <laughs> oh no. Here, let me see. This. <laughs> Look guys, we're doing real life together. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> This is real life. Yeah. And it's live. Perfect. It's perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, I love it. Okay. Hello, how's that? Oh, my Jesus. Is that oh, better? you're here now, Seth. It's good to see you, buddy. <laughs> yeah, you too. There we go. Yeah. Now, you carry, I mean, you carry a, um, a profound revelation of righteousness and the ability to uh, add humor and simplicity. And so I, I just love that about you. you. You communicate the gospel from the finished work of the cross mm -hmm. through relationship with Jesus. And you see Jesus way bigger than the enemy. And, and you talk about living carefree. There's so many directions I want to go with you, but I want to say some trigger words. Okay. For you and see what happens. Okay? okay. What does the word hyena mean to you? So the hyena is one of the three animals in the animal kingdom that laughs. And hyena, as you know, is an African um, animal, but they travel in packs, they hunt in packs, and they laugh for a very specific reason. So most of us see hyena through the lens of Lion King. You know, they're pretty negative, pretty bad. They're bad guys in that movie, which sure. Okay. But, um, in the animal kingdom, they laugh while they're hunting to confuse their prey. So when I think of hyenas in the kingdom, like what's it mean? Like, what does that mean for us as people is like, Oh, joy is really important. Well, for one, we're on offense, not defense. So we're the hunters. Uh, we're the ones hunting in packs. We hunt in community. We travel together. We work together. We love each other. We support each other. And we support each other with our joy. And our joy, a believer who lives in community and is joyful and is on offense, a community that lives on offense filled with joy actually confuses the enemy that they're hunting. And so there's a few things in there. We're on offense. We need to be in community. We want to live joyfully because joy confuses our enemy. And then that gives us the advantage over him to not just live on offense, but actually do damage and destroy him. So that's that's what I think of when I hear hyena. And kookaburra? Same thing. Kookaburra is a snake-eating bird in Australia. They call it the kookaburra they like they say it weird maybe that's not perfect but they they have a funny way to say it kookaburra and they um kookaburra something like that but the the it 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 laughs to declare its territory come so on it's a, it's a territory declaring laugh and they kill snakes so they're a quick bird and they have a long beak and they can just grab um, snakes and they just swallow them whole. So a lot of pictures you'll see on the internet, you can Google it. They'll be standing there on a branch and the snake is just hanging out of his mouth and they just swallow the whole thing whole. So snakes are not an issue for for a laugh a laughing Christian. And also like one thing that we need to understand, sometimes Christians get nervous like when we talk about animals and, and animal kingdom and the, the kingdom of God. And, but if you think about it, Jesus is both a lion and a lamb. So Jesus uses animals to help us understand his nature, who he is. And so lions and lamb, a lion and a lamb help us understand Jesus. The dove, the Holy Spirit came down like a dove. The the Lord, you know, the devil came as a serpent. The, the devil also, the, the Bible also says when Jesus was talking about um, the sower goes out to sow and the seed falls on four different types of ground. The first type of ground it falls on, the birds of the air come and take the seed so it never takes root, never grows in our lives. And then he, he interpreted the parable to mean, to, to explain to his disciples. First of all, he said this to the disciples. He said, if you don't understand this parable, how then will you understand all the parables? So this is an important thing for us to understand. And when he explained the parable to the disciples, he said, the bird is the devil. So Jesus goes, hey, the, 
The devil's a bird. We also see the devil like a dragon in Revelation and stuff like this. So animals help us understand not just the animal kingdom, but the spirit realm. The you know our king, our king, our lord, our savior is a lion and a lamb. And so, and our the spirit that fills us is a dove and is like a dove. And so, um, you know, when we take post a posture of being a joyful Christian that can laugh. When the enemy, when other birds, when the when the bird of the devil is trying to fly in and take the word of God from our heart before it has a chance to germinate, before it has a chance to grow, before it has a chance to take root. If the devil is trying to fly in and take those seeds, which another part of that parable is that's on the that's on the, the ground that's been trampled underfoot. Jesus talks about. So it's the hard ground, it's the hard soil, it's been trampled underfoot. So what's that mean? The devil tries to come into the areas of our heart where people have walked all over, where people have used our heart as a path, you know. Emotional abuse, physical abuse, spiritual abuse, pain, just neglect, all the stuff where it's like, dude, my heart is hard when it comes to family my, because of my parents, my dad, whatever. My heart is hard when it comes to leaders because I had a controlling pastor or whatever. My boss is super controlling. Like, okay, I have a hard heart in this area because people have walked all over and trampled all over. Well, that's where the devil will try to fly in. And God will speak to us in those areas and try to like grow something else in our hearts, grow something beautiful, grow fruit in our lives. And the bird will fly in and try to take it. But joy, a joyful Christian can go, ha, 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 ha. And joy actually says, no, no, birds, this is my territory. You don't come in here. Or this beak that swallows the snake will also peck you. So it also has to do with potentially you're going to go to the next animal, the laughing woodpecker, the woodpecker who also is the laugher. Um, the cartoon based on the laughing woodpecker is Woody the woodpecker. So ha 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 ha, right? Well, the woodpecker laughs also to declare territory, to announce to the other bird, don't come in here or I'm a woodpecker, right? So the kookaburra says, if you come in here, I'm going to peck you. Or if the snake tries to come here i'm gonna swallow it up whole i'm gonna eat the snake but the woodpecker like you do not want to get pecked by a woodpecker the devil does not want to invade the territory of a joyful christian a christian who laughs because when he hears the laugh of a joyful christian he knows they know i'm trying to sneak in here they know i'm trying to come in here but they're telling me this is their territory and if i fly in here and try and take the seeds that god is growing in these hard places these these things that god is trying to heal and restore and and, and change over in their lives in these hard places where people walk all over when the devil hears that laugh he thinks i better not go in there or the woodpecker think about if you got pecked by a woodpecker that would hurt worse than any other bird like because they'll just pound you they'll just pound your head and so the devil doesn't like that doesn't want that he's afraid of a joyful laughing christian and so but the woodpecker the laughing woodpecker it's also his maiden call that's how he attracts intimacy from mates it's how he you know the the girls hear the laughing call they hear the laughter and they come. And so wow. it's cool for us to realize like a joyful Christian is one that's positioned for intimacy with their lover, Jesus, with the bridegroom. It's when I laugh, when I'm joyful, when I enjoy what Jesus has done, I attract an intimate relationship with him. If I don't enjoy what Jesus has done, I actually keep away a relationship I could have. If I would just be joyful, he's going, you know what? Like who wants to be in a in a marriage with a grumpy person? Jesus still wants to marry us. Jesus still wants intimacy with us. But when we're grumpy and we don't celebrate what he's done, who he is, we don't enjoy that. It's a lot harder for us for a deep, intimate, loving relationship with Jesus. But when we enjoy what he's done, when we rejoice in him, when we rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say we rejoice, when we know that the will of God for us in Christ Jesus is give thanks always, no, in everything give thanks, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. This is the will of God. When we understand rejoicing always is God's will for us, then we attract a level of relationship most Christians don't understand because they don't understand joy. They don't understand laughter. They don't understand it confuses your prey. 
it declares your territory and i'm telling you it attracts intimacy so those are the animals when you say the animals that's that's where i go i love it i never saw it as um attracting intimacy that's what i preach on a lot you know yeah. is intimacy um yeah. and being connected with jesus the you know hebrews 1 9 i love that i love that scripture mm -hmm. because if if you if you love righteousness all of a sudden you get smeared with joy yeah here's you know? what Here's yeah. what's so crazy. Look at look at this. Hebrews 1 9. Like this is one of my life verses. I have a lot of Mine too. <laughs> this one's super important because watch this. So Hebrews 1 9, you've loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Right? Therefore, God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than all your companions. So look, so if you look in the world right this minute. If you just look at the news right this minute, it's really easy to go, you know what? I hate lawlessness. I hate it. There's a lot of lawlessness going on. Um, another translation says, you've loved righteousness and hated evil. There's a lot of evil happening in the world right now. So so it's, it's easy to look at the news, to look at the world and go, you know what? I hate evil. But this is saying, if you actually hate lawlessness and you actually hate evil, God goes, now I can anoint you with the oil of gladness more than everyone around you. So what's supposed to happen in the Christian's heart is to go, you know what? I hate all the evil that's happening and that actually positions me to be joy more joyful supernaturally more joyful than everyone around me it's like wait a second time so, out yeah time out you you're opening something huge okay time out because if you if you okay okay so people think like this man this is awesome people think if you hate it You'll show by being mean, being negative, oppressing, getting yeah. burdened down. But what you're opening is a revelation that is not that. It's the opposite. Yeah, look. Okay, this, come on. Yeah. This, here's it's this is saying basically this. It's saying the way you actually recognize somebody who truly hates evil is God has made them happier than everyone around them. Why? The joy of the Lord is our strength. So if you hate evil and don't receive the anointing of gladness, you don't receive strength to face the evil, to change the evil, to do anything about it. So if I just get grumpy and like, bro, oh, I hate all the evil happening. I'm so grumpy about all the evil that's happening. It's like, okay, well, you're not receiving what God's trying to give you. You're just responding to what you see. You're not responding to him. You're responding to them. And so you're grumpy, you're upset. And guess what? You just get weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker to do anything about it, to pray into it, to change it, to shift it, whatever, to even get in position. God can't even trust us to help solve the evil in the world until we receive the joy that gives us the strength to then face that stuff and do something about it. It's the modern day Samson's. Like, think about it. Like Samson was a, was called by God, anointed by God, destined by, by God to be untouchable and unstoppable and defeat enemies that no one else could defeat. How? He protected his hair, the source of his strength. When we don't receive joy, the anointing of joy into our lives when we hate evil, then we don't actually receive strength and we become like Samson who let Delilah cut his hair. When we let this world cut off our joy from our way we think, the way we see things, then what happened to Samson? They poked out his eyes and made him walk in circles the whole the rest of his life. And yeah, he did some damage at the end, but what would have happened if he hadn't given up his hair? What would have happened if we would actually not give up our joy and receive joy and live in joy is we would actually be so strong. We'd be untouchable, we'd be unstoppable, and we wouldn't lose our vision and we wouldn't walk in circles. There's way too many Christians walking in circles without vision because they don't receive joy when they hate the evil in the world. When they see what the enemy is doing, they don't look at what God is doing. Come on, Psalm 2, Psalm 37, Psalm 59, all three of those Psalms, there's, there's, the writer is writing about what all the evil happening around him, all the things the enemy's planning. He's whispering, he's plotting, he wants to separate, he wants to, oh, the nations plot in vain trying to break apart the lord the, the anointed like it's it's crazy here i'll just read it to you because yeah um, i'm loving it psalm I'm two feeling, psalm three, 
Psalm 59, Psalm 2, it says here, why, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So he starts the whole psalm writing about what the enemy's up to, what the enemy's planning, what the enemy is doing. And then somewhere between verse 3 and 4, he gets smart and he goes, you know what, let me look at God. I'm looking at the enemy. Let me look at God. And then verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens shall laugh. So the Lord is laughing in heaven. And when we do on earth what we see him doing in heaven, we actually bring his strength into our lives. We actually bring his kingdom into our lives. Why? Because the kingdom is righteous. And so we bring it into our lives. And then we have a So and then if you if you read the rest of Psalm 2, like it's the biggest, it's some of the biggest revelations of identity and destiny and inheritance ever. Basically, next it says, the Lord said to me, today you're my son, or you're my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me, I'll give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. So it's like, why aren't the Christians the earth? Because they won't look at God, they just look at the enemy. They won't laugh when God is laughing in heaven. They won't laugh. They won't have joy. They resist joy at every turn. And God and people, Christians are like, why don't I feel like I'm a son of God? Why do I feel like I'm a slave? Why do I live in this place where God is and we do that the next thing that comes is you're my son ask me i'll give you the nature come on it's so crazy as you're bringing revelation i promise you the guy that's mowing the lawn is getting closer and closer i know i hear him he's coming he's coming in i know just love oh. us guys and give us grace. Oh, one more thing. This is this is great. So Hebrews 1 9, it's like, well, joy is supernaturally happier than everyone around them, right? So that's that's how you recognize a person that hates evil. Like, hates wickedness. like wow, you must really hate wickedness because you're so happy. You really hate evil because you're so happy. But if you um if you go to so in the church. I, I, hold that thought. I'm going to ask if they can stop, okay? All right, perfect. Or you just keep going. Verse <clears throat> This is good right here. Come on, this is really good. While we take our little break. Somebody said, Dila, Dila, Dila said he should come and join us. Yes, he should. Come on. Um, so here, I'll just keep going for all you guys that are still here. Sounds like he's walking away or quieting up or something. But so Hebrews 1 9 says, those who love righteousness and hate wickedness or hate evil. So we want to let the Bible interpret the Bible. So hating evil is a really important thing to realize here. And Proverbs 8 13 says this the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. So part of what this verse is saying is saying, if you love righteousness and you hate evil and you fear God, then God anoints you with the oil of gladness beyond all your companions. So how do you recognize a person that actually fears God? Because a lot of times when we talk about joy or we're a happy Christian, I've had so many people go, yeah, brother. Okay, brother. But what about the fear of the Lord? Well, the fear of the Lord is actually to hate evil, according to Proverbs 8, 13. And if you hate evil, God makes you supernaturally more joyful than everyone around you. So the only way to truly recognize a person that hates evil and fears God is they're more joyful than everyone else around. Why? Because they don't fear all the other stuff. They fear God, not that. And that makes them joyful more than anyone else. I was hoping, I caught the end of it, but I was hoping you would connect that, you know, um, the fear of God and and being joyful and carefree. There it is. Yeah. Um, Lord, I ask for that revelation uh, just to even grow in us, God. Yeah. You know, let it get so big that we're able to communicate it and bring others into it Come on. because it's freedom. That is such freedom, you know, and it, OK, if, if I'm writing you this prescription, let me let me say this. If I write you a prescription to look at yourself in the mirror and laugh, what is this a prescription for? Everything. 
<laughs> so the you Bible seriousness doesn't end depression. No. Tony Robbins, Tony Robbins, who's a master coach, like he's not fully kingdom by any means, but he's a master coach. He, t I, I read a story that he, um, these psychologists had suicidally, suicidally depressed people come into their offices. You know, they lay down on the couch and they talk about all their problems forever and ever and ever. And they weren't having breakthroughs. So they talked about, he told a story where these, these psychologists, or maybe it was one or something, they actually had people stand up, go look in the mirror and laugh and smile. If they couldn't laugh, they would just like look in the mirror and start smiling at themselves and look at themselves smiling. And he said they wouldn't allow them to talk about their problems. They wouldn't allow them to lay down. They had to stand up in the mirror. They had to put their hands on their hips. They had to like get, just get confident. They had to position their body to be actual confident. And then they smiled at themselves. They looked at themselves. They smiled. They laughed. And he said it was only a matter of time before all of them weren't suicidally depressed anymore. And none of them talked through any of their problems. They just laughed at themselves. And, and things shifted in their lives. And so even, even like normal science, worldly science is recognizing the importance and power of joy and laughter. And here's what's so crazy, you know, Galatians 4, this is even another level. Like Galatians 4, this is such an important chapter in the Bible. It's one of, it's like a crazy important chapter in the Bible. But here's what it says in verse 28. You know, it's all this stuff about the two covenants, about the law, the grace, the new covenant, the old covenant, etc. But you get down to verse 28 and it, and it says, now we, brethren, brothers and sisters, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So we are like Isaac, right? Well, in the Bible, names reveal nature. So, and, and the name Isaac in Hebrew means laughter. So God is saying... Now you, brothers and sisters, as laughter was, so are you, children of promise. You, it is your nature to be joyful. It is your nature to laugh. It's not just something we do. Laughter is who we are. Joy is who we are. We are, God names us, laughter. He calls us laughter. I love that. You're speaking my language. Um, it, it says that Ishmael persecuted um, Isaac, mm -hmm. the son that's free. And that's, you know, um, yeah, religion it's, always persecutes freedom, yep. spirit led things, you know, and yep. it has like this appearance of wisdom to be more serious means that it, it, it's not really true that you're getting it more or that you're understanding more. No, but to be carefree means that you believe Jesus. Yeah, exactly. You trust Jesus. You trust, trust Jesus. Why? Because, yeah. And that's, so here, here's what this, this verse says that you, you said, it says, but as he who was born according to the flesh, which was Ishmael, then persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now. So in other words, it's saying the old covenant, because he says Ishmael is the old covenant, Isaac's new one. Basically, the old covenant tries to persecute you so you won't be who you are, so you won't be joyful. So religion actually attempts to persecute the, the born of the spirit believer so they won't be joyful, so they'll be like them keeping track of their sins, paying attention to their sins, trying to do it in their own strength, trying to do it in their own effort, which if you read carefully, it's saying this is the flesh. One was born according to the flesh. One was born according to the spirit. Well, how was he born according to the flesh? Abraham and Sarah had a huge promise. They had a massive promise, but they came up with this great idea to make the promise happen in their own ideas, their own wisdom, their own strength. And so instead of trusting God, they, they got Hagar, and they say, you know what? Have sex with Hagar and we'll call, we'll pretend like it's God's promise to us. And so they, Abraham and Hagar have sex. They make a baby. It's Ishmael. And they go, woohoo, God's promise. He's like, no, no, I want to do it with you. I actually want to do it with you, but you have to take on the identity I'm giving you. You have to take on my name. Ha, Abraham, Sarah. You have to take my name inside your name. You have to take my identity inside your identity. When you line up your identity with who I am and what I've said about you, then you'll actually become fruitful and able to, re to, to produce the promises you're supposed to produce, not in your own ideas, not in your own efforts, by trusting the identity I've given you. Mm. 
I love that. I was going to try to persecute you to not be joyful. That's that's one of the points of this is religion's still going to try to persecute you so you won't be joyful, so you won't okay. laugh, so you won't be yourself. So you'll do it in your own strength, in your own effort, yeah. in your own wisdom, your own ideas, in the flesh. You'll do it in the flesh. Yeah. Ooh, Let's yeah. just yeah. even go further because we're going to talk about Holy Ghost um, – this is all Holy Ghost, man. You need this even to parent. You need it to, to wake up in the morning, to yeah. go to Walmart. To, you, need, you need all this to do life. Yes. So um, let me see where to go here. <laughs> Think about this. Think about this. Think, Man, this is a different direction, but not really. Yeah. When Jesus was baptized, the heavens opened. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I find great pleasure, in whom I am well pleased. So the Father goes, You know what? I love you. You're my beloved Son. I'm pleased with you. You have my pleasure over your life. Jesus had not faced the devil yet. He'd not had a temptations. So God didn't speak his pleasure over Jesus because he overcame all the temptations of the enemy, he spoke his pleasure over Jesus so he could overcome the temptations of the enemy. And when the devil came to Jesus 40 days later, he said this, he almost quoted the father. He said this, he said, if you are the son of God, turn stones into bread, right? You remember this? So he left out a couple important things from what the father said. Listen close. The father said, this is my... Beloved son, in whom I find great pleasure, right? The, the devil comes 40 days later and says, if you are the son, what word did he leave out? Beloved. Why? If he can get you to forget how loved you are, he'll get you to fall for anything he wants you to. And he leaves out the word pleasure because he wants you to think, if you overcome me, if you overcome temptation, then I'll be, when God will be pleased with you. But God said, no, no, I'm pleased with you so you can overcome temptation, so you can start your ministry. He hadn't even done any miracles. He hadn't even preached anything. He hadn't even done anything yet. This was not anything he had done. It was to empower him to do it. So the joy of the Lord, the pleasure of God, the love and the pleasure of God over our life helps us defeat temptation, helps us overcome the enemy, no matter how tired, no matter how hungry, no matter how strong he comes. The pleasure of God and the love of God helps us overcome the temptations of the enemy and positions us to do mystery in great power. Mm, I love this. Yeah, think about this. What was the temptation? The first temptation, turn stones into bread. So what was the Ten Commandments written on? Stone. Turn religion, turn your obedience, turn your efforts, turn your works, turn obedience to the rules into something that will nourish and satisfy and feed you. And Jesus goes, no, thanks. That's not a miracle I'm going to do. For one, I will not question. I will not question God's love for me. I will not question God's pleasure for me. You can leave it out of the sentence, but you can't pull it out of my heart. You can leave it out of what you said to me, but you can't take it out of here. I'm not going to question God's love. I'm not going to question my father's pleasure. And no, I will not turn the law into something that will feed me. I'm sorry. I won't do that. I love that revelation. When we lose sight of God's love for us, when we lose sight of his pleasure over our lives, then we fall for temptation and we try to go into religion. We try to feed ourselves on what we can do, our obedience, our ability. All of a sudden we're like, uh, we try to follow all the rules and we end up breaking our teeth, not feeding ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's packed. That's a packed revelation. I, I, what I, I want to jump because, okay, you're talking about the enjoyment of God. You're talking about the pleasure of God. You're talking about identity. Um, you're talking about loving righteousness. You're talking about just believing Jesus. All of that is packed into what you're saying. But there's some really natural things that happen on the natural, a joy level. What it does to our brain yeah. is release feel good chemicals yeah. like oxytocin or for nephron dopamine. Those are chemicals that are being released in the natural that usually people try to take a pill to get. Exactly. I mean, I'm just going to bring it into like, yeah. 
you know, the natural realm, you want a dose of Holy Ghost, you're asking for feel good chemicals in your brain to happen. And you're creating new pathways in your brain, highways to happiness, yeah. memories of joy, yeah. you know, a, a maze tunnel of glory. It's like yeah. you're creating new things, even in your brain, like, you know, this isn't a revelation that you can just say that's for someone else. No, you need all this to do life and do life well. And you won't come back to God if you don't enjoy him. Yeah. And, th and think about this. You know where the Bible says a joyful heart is good medicine. So there's a lot in there too. But if there's good medicine, that means there's also bad medicine. So what's bad medicine? It treats your symptoms. What's good medicine? It heals your problem. It heals, it heals the problem. So a joyful heart is God's prescription for any problem. So whatever it is, like if I'm struggling with depression, like when I, when I agree with God and I'm a I have a joyful heart and I let joy out and I laugh and I smile and I, I, enjoy, I enjoy Jesus, I'm actually, I'm actually taking my medicine. So I can get healed in my body. I can get healed in my mind. I, I, can, I can actually get healed because I'm taking good medicine. And it's good medicine that actually fixes the problem. And where most people are like, you know, most people think if you're a joyful Christian, you're just avoiding the real problems. No, no, you're actually trying to solve them. You're actually trying to heal them. Joy, think about it. Like we're Christians are supposed to be the pharmacists of the great physician. So the great physician goes, you know what? You got this problem going on. Let me write you a prescription. And here's what it is. A joyful heart. Take that to the pharmacist and get it. So the pharmacist goes, oh, here, let me go get you your prescription. I'm going to go grab the bottle. I'll bring it right back. And they bring it back. Go, here you go. It's a joyful heart. Take two of these and call me you know, call us in a week, let us know. You'll probably want to refill this prescription for the rest of your life. You know, even though it heals your problem, you probably just want to keep taking it because it feels so good. It's such a good thing. You know, it's not just to solve the problem. It'll actually strengthen your whole system so you don't have more problems later. But it's the prescription the great physician writes for the pharmacist to distribute. And that's what we're called to be. That's what I'm doing right now is I'm distributing the joyful heart, the good medicine to help us agree with the father, agree with the truth and, and take good medicine to help solve our problems, not avoid them. And what's crazy about most Christians is they, they, they don't think of it in these terms. And so they say things like, you know, that's all good. Being joyful is good. You must have everything just right in your life. Everything must be right with you. Everything must be good with you. Like, no, no, no. You, that's like saying, you know what? I got my prescription from the doctor. I have my pills here. I have my bottle, but I think I'll take them after I'm here. So I'll take my medicine once I'm healed. No, no. In the Bible, you, in, in life, you do not take medicine after you're healed. You take medicine to get healed. You take medicine to help you get healthy. And so if you're not taking a joyful heart, it won't help you get healthy. You'll just put it off and put it off and put it off until we get healthy. Like, no, that's the whole point of the joyful heart to make you healthy. I love this. I love this. Now, so I, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Love it. we hereby give you a prescription and, and you need to take two pills in the morning, two pills in the afternoon, two pills in the evening. You need to keep your heart filled with joy and just, just take it. And then you need to prescribe this to other people. You need to give joy away. The best part is your insurance covered it. Like somebody already paid for this prescription. Somebody paid for the prescriptions for the whole planet. <laughs> right. A hefty price. Your insurance policy covers this. This is the best prescription you could possibly have. It's already paid for by the blood of Jesus. Mm. Oh, he paid for it. He gave it to us. They're like we can go to the pharmacy and collect it all day. Oh, come on. Yeah. Well, guess what else is present? When you have joy, it means you're in his presence. Exactly. When you're in his presence and he's looking at you, you're not afraid. Yes. Come on. <laughs> oh, love it. Oh my gosh, I love it. There's this. Okay, so I want to talk about parenting. We've got so many moms on here. And come on. You know, okay, for me, I'm just going to give an example. Um, sometimes 
I'll parent out of frustration and I want them to just do what I say very quickly because yeah. I lack the communication skills or the ability that if I just give them um, the chance to make their own decision, they'll choose the right one. How does, I mean, that's kind of a packed, that's yeah. like an underlying thing in everybody, you know? That can be a huge, yes. So a lot of times we get frustrated because we don't have a good plan and we don't have consequences ready. So consequences are really important for children because they have to understand if I, if I make this choice, this will happen. If I make that choice, that will happen. So whatever we, we have to actually instill this in our kids. So, but I can stay peaceful. I can stay joyful. I can stay calm and out of frustration if I actually have a plan. So if I have a plan for what I'm going to do during bedtime, if I empower my kids by telling them what the plan is, letting them know of the consequences, and doing it ahead of time so I'm not frustrated. I'm totally fine, I'm totally peaceful. Like, hey guys, you know what? This is what I do with my son. Like, hey buddy, if you come out of bed, it's, it's all good. You can come out of bed if you want. If you come out of bed, you have to go to your crib. Do you wanna to go to your crib? No. So I have a consequence ready. If you make this choice, I have a consequence. If you wanna make that choice, you know what happens. If you stay in bed, you get to stay in bed. You don't have to go to your crib. And I'm not frustrated because he hasn't got out of bed yet. And I have a plan and I'm empowering him with the plan. So a lot of times what happens is we don't empower our children because we're not being powerful because we haven't made a plan because we have no consequences because we just expect our children to obey because we said so. But if we have a consequence, they learn to obey and they learn the reason why to obey. And so if I have a consequence ready, I feel powerful. And then I can empower them. If I don't have a consequence ready, then when they get out of bed, I get powerless because they just made a choice that took away my power because you didn't obey me. And so now you've taken away my power. And usually when I'm angry, powerless, powerlessness is underneath it. So I feel powerless. So I get frustrated and angry. And I just want you to do what I said. But if I had just had a consequence ready, I would have I would have felt more powerful. I could have empowered you. And then if you make that choice, you're the one that's disempowered yourselves and pulled away freedom. And now you get to go to your crib. So having a plan with consequences is better because sometimes we're like, hey, don't do that. Stop doing that. I told you to knock it off. And we talk, we talk to these let's say they're, they're branches that are starting to grow. So a child has a behavior that's like a branch and it starts growing and it's really small. And we're like, hey, branch, stop growing. Branch, stop growing. I told you to quit growing, branch. Quit growing, branch. Hey, branch, stop growing. Hey, branch, quit growing, quit growing, quit growing. Oh my gosh, I told you, branch, stop growing. Ah, and now we're so mad. We get out the chainsaw of punishment. We punish our kids and we have to cut the branch off. Well, if you just had a consequence, I call them the snippers of consequence. If you just had a consequence snipper, when that when that branch, where am I at? When that branch starts to grow, you just come over here like, oh, it's okay. You can go to your crib now. Snip. Well, okay. So I literally did this for two days with our little guy. I'm like, buddy, if you come out, it's cool. It's totally fine. Come on out of bed, but then you have to sleep in your crib. Do you want to sleep in your crib? No, dad. Okay, cool. Then stay in bed. You stay in bed, you get to stay in bed. So he comes out. I said, oh, no, buddy. I'm so sorry. You got to go to your crib. I put him in his crib. I said, hey, you know what? If you're quiet, I'll let you back out in a couple minutes. You want to come back out? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. If you're quiet, I'll come back in and get you out. And I come back in. He's quiet. I come back in. I get him out. I put him in his bed. The next night he comes out. Oh, no, buddy. I'm so sorry. You got to go. To and I'm still powerful. I'm not frustrated. I'm powerful. I'm not using fake power of anger. I'm so powerful. Okay, buddy. All right, let's go back into your crib. Hey, if you're quiet, I'll let you back out. So I did it for two nights. Literally, I don't have to do anything anymore. I just say, hey, if you come out, you got to go to your crib. So all of that to say, and he he stays in his bed, no problem. And and it's like once in a while, he'll, he'll do it again. If I just follow through with the consequence, I snip the branch again. Oh, that branch is trying to grow again. Snip, snip. And then he, he goes back in bed and we're like, okay, the behavior has gone because I consequence it away. I don't have to get out the chainsaw because I let this thing grow and it's taking over the whole house and now I have to try to figure it out and with anger and punishment and all that stuff. So all that to say, sometimes we parent from frustration because we don't have a plan and we don't use consequences. We just expect obedience without any consequences where God's like, hey, hey Adam and Eve, don't eat that tree. It would be really great 
if you obeyed what I told you. <laughs> and God allows them to disobey. And he left the tree right in front of them. And he left the serpent there to tempt them. Wow. God, why are you doing this? Because he's not interested in obedience alone. Of course he loves obedience. Of course he wants obedience. But he'll also allow you to disobey so you have a consequence, so you learn why it's better to obey than it is to disobey. Oh, now I have a consequence. I'm kicked out of the garden. Oh, my gosh, I can't. Why? And he even delivered the consequence. Why? So they couldn't eat from the tree of life and get permanently stuck. He, he delivered a consequence to protect them, not to punish them, to protect them from making it worse. And so if you think about this, it's like God's not interested in control. Of course he wants obedience. But how did Jesus learn obedience? Please hear me. I have no idea what this verse means. It's, I think it's in Hebrews. It says, Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. Now, we know Jesus never disobeyed. Jesus never sinned. I know that. We all know that. Jesus obeyed perfectly. But the Bible still says Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered. No idea what that means. No clue. But if Jesus learned obedience through the things he suffered, then our children need to learn obedience through the consequences of their choices. And so then they learn. Oh, if I get out of bed, I have to go to my crib. I don't like going to my crib. I want to stay in my bed. So I need to stay in my bed and not get out. And, and I need to be quiet and I need to do this. So, oh, so, so you learned obedience through the things you suffered. And because you're thinking all this out for yourself at three, four years old, you're thinking, I don't like going to my crib. So maybe I should just stay in bed. Wow, now you learn how to think. I didn't tell you what to think. I didn't even have to tell you what to do. You're thinking. You're learning to think for yourselves. If I do this, that happens, and I don't want that. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something else. Like, oh, wow, we just killed a lot of birds with one stone right there. But that's what it comes down to. We parent from frustration when we don't have a plan and we don't use consequences. And we expect obedience without them having consequences for their choices. But even Jesus learned obedience through that. I love this because you're setting us up for long term and you're more interested in their own development and how they process so that they can make good choices. And so that you're not always having to make them for your child. Yes. Um, but a lot yes. of a lot of stuff happens when you're doing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say that's why so many parents are exhausted because they're they're thinking for themselves and all their kids. So I have three kids. You know how exhausting it is to think for four people and make decisions for four people? That's what happens when, when we control our kids and we tell them what to do and we tell them what to think all the time. We get exhausted instead of letting them make a bad choice and facing a consequence. And now they're the ones that are exhausted because they're having to think through all of it. My mom's not mad. My dad's not mad. I just got a consequence. I don't like the consequence. So they're the ones doing all the mental work. And then you go to bed and they're like, they're mentally exhausted. And you're not. Why? Because I'm only thinking for one person, not four. This goes even deeper. It's, it's like the foundation, even for work environments, for bosses that run companies. This is, this is the whole um, how you raise good leaders, yeah. you empower them to make decisions. So this this is actually the foundation that's carried throughout your lifetime, right? Sure. So, we're, we're setting them up to be healthy grownups because they yeah. know how to do themselves. And I mean, if you just look at the world right now, we got a whole lot of people that obviously never had consequences for their choices. And think about abortion. Think about it. what is abortion? Abortion is... We've tried everything we possibly could to avoid the consequences for our choices. So what's the consequence of sex? Babies. You have sex, you make babies, right? So we, we tried condoms. We tried um, the pill. We tried uh, all this stuff, right? And so the, the last measure is, you know what? How do we avoid consequences for our choices? I don't want consequences for my choices. I want to have sex and do whatever I want and not have any consequences. And that's where abortion comes in. And now it's like, oh, we've created a whole entire culture that has zero consequence 
for their choices. Like, oh, I can do whatever I want. And, and this is the most disempowering thing for women. Feminists should be super angry about this because about abortion, because abortion disempowers women because it allows men to do whatever they want. A man doesn't even have to pull out. A man doesn't have to carry a condom. A man doesn't have to, to be abstinent. A man doesn't have any responsibility. He can go off in any woman he wants, and because she can go get an abortion, he has to have no self-control whatsoever. And I'm sorry if I'm talking rude. I'm sorry if I'm talking whatever. It's like, but if you think about this, a man now gets to do whatever he wants. He doesn't even have to resist anything, and he can just go off, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, you know what, woman? You'll pay the consequence for my choices. You'll go get an abortion. You'll risk that. You'll do that. You'll you'll get an abortion because for one, you wanted so much. For, you wanted no consequences for yourself. But you also just gave me as a man the freedom to do whatever I want. And it's the most disempowering thing for the women in our lives is to give men that much freedom, that much permission to, we, we totally disempower the women to say, oh, you can have an abortion. And so what is that? It's all an attempt to get rid of consequences for our choices, which raises a whole bunch of people who think I get to do whatever I want. No one's ever going to do anything like, yeah, even the government is trying, we're trying to get the government to pay for our abortions. So that way we don't even have to pay money. It's like, think about it. If you had to pay $500 for an abortion, that right there would be another barrier. And you go, you know, Know what maybe we should wear a condom or maybe we shouldn't even have sex because the consequence of having sex is babies and if we have a baby that we didn't want oh my gosh now we have to pay 500 bucks i don't want to pay 500 bucks it will give you some sort of measure of obedience self-control right mm -hmm. so you can see it with all of it everything happening in society not everything a lot of what's happening society right now is a whole bunch of kids that never had consequences and get really really angry if you try to bring a consequence into their life for their behavior come on this is so big i want to touch on that it, it, even even like what you're saying there it goes um into you get into objectification you lose your value i mean the consequences aren't just uh one and done it is devaluing life yeah it we is um setting you up for genocide i mean yeah. let's that's, just that's the crazy thing we think we remove the consequences through abortion but all we did was create a whole bunch of other ones yeah and women are all mentally psychologically traumatized even if they're like even if they love abortion and they are they're happy they killed their child they're happy they had an abortion even like and i don't know there's probably people watching that have had abortions like god's not god's not mad at you God's got your babies. God's going to reunite you with your babies. God can heal it all. God can heal it all. He loves you. He loves you. It's the whole reason Jesus died because we've all made these types of decisions. I may not have ever had an abortion because I'm a man, but I've made decisions that have hurt his heart. And that's the whole point of him dying is to forgive us and to restore us and to heal us and to bring us back into. So there's no shame around any woman that's had an abortion. But the crazy thing is we removed one consequence and we, we brought in a whole bunch more. Now we got all these women that are struggling and not doing well. It's like, oh yeah, all the mental, psychological, emotional consequences that happen are worse than if we'd had the other consequence for our choice. So we remove some and we get other ones. My, uh, my mom, um, I, was a, I was such a rough kid, Seth. I mean, I was, a, I was a really rough kid. I had a life sentence at the age of 14 for committing a crime. I ended up escaping the detention center, getting pregnant, you know? I mean, talk about a child raging out of control. I mean, but my mom, my mom would go, oh, uh-huh, hello, come get her. You want some consequences, Amber? You wanna act like this? Yeah. So I learned really quickly like my mom's not playing that game and I'm going to get a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, from my consequences of my choices, man, <laughs> they were extreme consequences, but I needed them. They helped me live life. Mm -hmm. I saw very quickly the result of my own actions. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, um, I, I'm just uh, identifying with the weight of consequences. They're beautiful. Let me tell you, it's empowered me to make decisions yeah. in life and yeah. be secure in the decisions because of because of what I faced, those yeah. consequences. Yeah. It's like, wait, if I do this, what does that mean? 
oh, it means this and this and this. Well, that's going to be horrible, so I probably shouldn't do this. Or, hey, if I do that, what's it going to mean? Oh, those are all great consequences. You know, it's like husbands and wives. Like, well, if I divorce my wife, I got to spend a lot of money. I traumatize my kids. Going to have be alone. Uh, I may have some more freedom, but I'm going to be alone. But if I actually pursue my wife and figure out how to how to connect and and get closer and all this stuff, like, what's the consequence of that? Well, wow, I'm really happy. My kids are more fulfilled. My kids have a dad in the home. My it's like so thinking that way. It's like, yeah. You, oh wait, I want really good consequences. So I think about what kind of consequences I want and what I don't want, and then I make decisions based on what I want to have happen in my life. It helps you. It helps. It helps all of us. And the younger we can bring that into our kids, the more it helps them not turn into the fourteen-year-old crazy. Because I was the same way. Like I was wild off the rails, just like you. And and like I didn't have a life sentence. Like wow, that's that's amazing that you're not in prison. Um, but like you, you'd you'd still be in prison. You'd still be. Yeah. In I like, had this, I, I just wrote this book, Seth. I'm going to send it to you. It's really short yeah, and you can not? read it. It's like my testimony, but this is all Jesus. Like I didn't have the capacity to love people. Um, I, I didn't understand compassion. I thought love was a weakness. And yeah, but uh, yeah, I ended up having this idea. Um, if I escape from this detention center with good behavior, um, I'm going to get moved to a lower facility. At the, I was always strategically thinking. Now it's used for the kingdom. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? But I was always planning ways to escape because I would have been in there until I was like 14 to 21. And so, um, yeah. And so anyway, so I, I said, if I get pregnant, if I escape, I think they'll let me out of here. Well, they did let me out of here. And and so when you talk about handling emotions, I didn't even know we were going to talk about this, but um, I knew how to handle anger and angle, anger. Blah, 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 blah. Just take a drink and have I know. A take a drink. This is not heavy. Take a drink. drink. We went from it's happy to heavy. Drink. Drink. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> yeah, just go kiss your face and laugh in the mirror. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, um, oh, Jesus. Oh, yeah. And so I decided, oh, but anger. I was such an angry individual that anger was very effective. It was a very effective tool for me because it produced an instant result. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know how to do was um, handle hurt because after I, they did let me out when I had my baby. So I ended up only doing three years and I got out at the age of 17, but um, I was left hurt. And that was something that um, I don't know, like that wasn't a tool in my toolbox that I even could deal with. And so I don't know. I'm just, we're just, and that's, and that's, you know, anger, it's anger pretty much has something underneath it all the time. So like, why am I angry? Cause you, I feel powerless. Why am I angry? Cause you hurt me. So you hurt me. Now I'm angry, but what's the problem? The problem isn't necessarily the anger. The problem is I'm hurt. And if I can learn how to get my hurt healed, I won't have any reason to be angry because I'm not hurt. And you don't keep bumping my scab while it's trying to heal. Like think about like people get so angry about little tiny things. Oh, all you're doing, you're, I'm just keep bumping your gaping wound. And so it's like, Oh, I'm not, I'm not necessarily angry. That's a fruit. The problem is I'm so hurting. And if I can get the hurt healed, the anger will fall off. The anger will fall away. Like the fruit will disappear. Why? Because there's no reason to be angry anymore because I'm not so hurting. And every person that encounters me doesn't accidentally bump into these giant gaping wounds in my heart. So I have no reason to be angry at them. And so that's, that's a huge deal. And especially with our kids and parents, like, my gosh, Every time my kids get angry, I say, hey, you're really mad. You're really angry. Did something hurt you? Yes, yes, I heard about it. Okay, good. Now you're not even angry anymore. You're crying. And now we can actually talk about the cause, not the fruit. We can talk about what happened that made you feel angry in the first place. Now I can actually heal you. I, I feel so lonely. They won't play with me. Oh my gosh. You're hurting because they won't play with you. You feel lonely. Here, can I hug you? Now I'm hugging you, not responding to your anger. I'm responding to your wound, to your hurt, not your anger. And so that's that's a huge deal. Like that one question in parenting, I, we totally took a rabbit trail. But that one question like, wow, you're really angry. So I acknowledge what you're feeling, but I'm addressing what's causing it. You are so angry right now. Did something hurt you? 
Yes. Okay. Now we're somewhere. Now we. Now we're already. Now we're already way deeper than than we ever were before trying to deal with the anger. Yeah, I love this. Dude, we, you know what? Probably I'm we needed whole, that. Yeah, I forgot. I need to tell you this. We. Um, I've been, I've been coaching. So I've had these parents to hire me to coach their kids and every child I've been coaching has all been on anger. And so I was like, Hmm, Lord, are you trying to do something? Wow. So we started this whole thing. It's on my Instagram. It's on my Facebook. I'm doing on Friday in just a few days. Um, what's today? Wednesday on Friday, we're doing this thing called, um, let me just pull it up here. Where'd it go? Oh, it just went up today. Um, anger busting secrets for a joy filled home, but it's designed for kids. So it, it, whoa, how did that happen? You see that it's green. And so, because do you have a green screen on it? Thinks no. it's a green screen. It's showing, whoa, it's, that's going, crazy. Right, it's going right through. So that's supposed to be green. But it's so I'm going to do a whole hour, 45 minutes of teaching for children how to actually address the problems so they're not so angry, how to forgive, why it's important to forgive. I'm, I'm going to do a whole thing for parents and kids. Mostly it's for kids like parents could totally put their kids on Zoom and leave the room. And I'm going to help their kids with the anger towards their parents, the anger towards their siblings, the anger towards their parents. I mean, towards their their teachers their classmates. We're going to go after we're going to go after this thing. But that's. That's something that's super common. And most people are just addressing the anger, not what's causing it. And so that's what we're going to do on Friday. And so it's on my Facebook and my Instagram and all that stuff. But it's on your Facebook Friday at what time? 6 p.m. Central time. So where are you at? East Coast. So 7 p.m. Yeah. your time, 4 p.m. California, 5 p.m. Mountain time. What but are other resources, Seth? That how do how else do people get a hold of you? How do they first of all talk about? I would love to give away some of Seth's books. Yeah, you yeah. Know, so, um, talk to me about some of the books you have out. And if you guys, I'm going to give away five of his books. So if you would like a book, he's going to mention the books. Yeah. Tell me which one you want, and then message me with your address so I can ship it to you. Um, somebody asked what ages would that be good for? It's basically, I would say if you have a kid five or under six or under, you definitely want to be there with them. Um, but if they're seven and up, maybe eight and up, they can, they could probably watch it on their own. Like, so I work with a 13 year old and an 11 year old and a seven year old right now that I meet with them on a regular basis. And these guys, um, so they're, they're good. Sometimes the seven year olds, it depends on how mature they are. This guy's really mature. So I work with him on his anger and all this stuff, but it's like, he, he can sit there by himself with me for an hour and talk where some kids can't. So I would say eight, seven, eight and up it's good for, but if they're younger, they could still do it. Like I'm going to do it in a kid friendly way, but it'll, they probably need you there with them. Um, what was I supposed to do? Talk about the books. Sorry. I read that question. Um, so the, yeah, first, no, no. the first book we wrote was win-win um, parenting, which we're starting to market this towards families that are interested in, in raising children who understand consequences and learn. Like it is very much a how to create a home and protect the culture of your home. It's very much how to, it's very practical. It's, 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 spiritually practical but it's a lot of discipline it's a lot of consequences so it's right up that alley the next book that we have coming out in um december 1st for parents specifically is called raising spirit-led kids i have i don't have the book yet because it comes out december 1st but it looks like this raising spirit-led kids and this is very it's also practically so the first one is spiritually practical this one's practically spiritual based i guess i don't know I just made that up, but this one is more like hearing God's voice, encountering God in the Bible, having a plan for your home that comes from God. He's the architect. We're the contractors. It's our job to contract and build what God has blueprinted out as the architect of our families. And that's where it starts. And um, then I have another book called um, Curing Worry God's Way, which has everything to do with like living carefree. Um, you know, Jesus talked a ton about worry, a ton. 
a ton, a ton, a ton about worry. And Paul talked about worry and Peter talked about worry. Like, hey, uh, he said, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him. So how do you humble yourself? You cast your cares on him. Why? Because he cares for you. So if I'm not living carefree, it's because I don't know how cared for I really am. And it's because I'm trying to handle things he wants to handle for me. And 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 if if humil if carefree, if a carefree life is the sign of humility, then an anxious, stressed out life is a sign of pride. And so we need to understand that. So I have win-win parenting. I have curing worry God's way. And then I have the new book coming out that's raising spirit led kids. And that comes out December 1st, but it's available for pre-order right now. Yeah. I would love to gift people that, um, five of you go ahead and say what book you would like, and then, um, message me your address and, um, I will send it to you. We had the privilege of sending out, um, curing worry. Yeah. Last time. People loved it. It was right on time. And so come on. you have so blessed me and I so love you. And yeah, um, yeah. hey, I, I'm going to end the broadcast, but hang on screen with me for a moment. Uh, would you pray us out, Seth? Yes. Lord, thank you so much that you've made us Isaacs, that we are full of joy. You've made us Samson's. You've made us untouchable and unstoppable, so strong. God, thank you for these strong people, strong parents, strong families, because they're they're they are joyful in their nature, in their deepest core. They're filled with joy. God, I pray that that joy would come out of them. They would live filled with joy. They would live protected by and protected and strong from your joy. And God, I pray for wisdom. God, your wisdom in their homes and their families and their relationships. We pray for your wisdom in everything they do and everything they put their hands to God, that they be full of wisdom, full of life and full of joy in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. I love you. Facebook. Mwah, we bless you. Guys, thanks yeah. for us. Until next time, guys. Come on. <laughs>